Hello, good morning or good evening or good afternoon whenever you happen to be watching this tape. My name's Albert Goshman and I'm going to magish for you. And with that tagline, I've started this magic show for the last 22 years. Let me give you a little history, a little background. I'm, I'm 65 years old today when we're shooting this tape. And I got into magic when I was 18, so I've been in this a long time. I was in New York City, I lived in New York City, and I remember back in the early 1940s going with my sister to see the magic shops in New York City, and there were three of them. There was Holden's and Robeson's, and later on Tannen opened. And I remember buying every 25 cent trick in the catalog and going home and being terribly disappointed. So that's how this began. I was, my father was in the bakery business, and at one point I picked up a tagline Baker the Faker. And uh, that came about in a funny way. I did a convention in Houston, Texas about 1956. And different people, different people were in charge of different aspects of the convention. Somebody did the registration, somebody hired the talent. And the fella that, that did the, hired the close-up thought my name was Mr. Baker. He didn't know why it was a baker, he, and so he painted a little sign that said, Baker the Faker, thinking that that was my name. So that's how that tagline got started, through that funny mistake of the guy that hired me for the Houston, Texas convention. So I've been staggering around in magic now for better than 40 years, and I've been a, an amateur, a professional, I've been a, a manufacturer, I've done, the, I've done the whole ball of wax. I take my word back on that. I've never, been a, I've never done stage magic, I've spent my my 40 some odd years doing small magic. In 1963, I went to the Magic Castle to lecture. This was about December of 63, and I put a bunch of little lectures together across the country. And I went to the castle and I did this little lecture. And uh, I, I got a job, or let's say another way is, I met two members of the castle who had an advertising agency. And they had just gotten the Hyatt House Hotel in the City of Commerce as a client. They were having a problem in, 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 in Hyatt. The restaurant wasn't doing well. So I broached the idea to the fellows in the advertising agency, why don't we do magic at the tables? And they sold the idea to the Hyatt, the Hyatt uh, executives. They printed some fancy little table tents, they put some ads in the local paper. And for the first time in my life, I, I became a... Uh, a table magician walking around, sitting at the table, doing magic at the Hyatt House in the City of Commerce. They eventually ended up sending me to the Hyatt House in Salinas. And I did, did magic at the table at Salinas. And then I came down to the Hyatt House that was at the airport. They had a little Hyatt House at the airport, at the Los Angeles International Airport, and I, I worked there. After that, I, I went to work at the Magic Castle in, 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 at the end of 64, and I worked there for six years as house magician. And that the act you're about to see began there. We had a member named Dr. Giovanni. He was a very famous pickpocket. And Dr. Giovanni did a little thing where he took a 10 cents, a dime, a one 10 cent piece, vanished it, and it appeared under a salt shaker. And I watched him do it one night, and I said, wow, that would be a clever way to find a coin. So that was the way this whole thing started. Seeing Dr. Giovanni vanish a dime, the rest of it would, would came as a result of, of that. I worked at the castle for six years, four and five shows a night, six nights a week. And the act that you're about to see developed as a result of that uh, long, long stand at the castle. I never said to myself, you can't do it, it's impossible. I tried it even if it was impossible, and sometimes you worked it out. <clears throat> Allow me at this time to, to tell you some of the background of some of the things you're going to see 
during the performance. We'll open with a little routine with a salt and pepper shaker. That's mine. We'll do sponge balls and the that's a little different routine in that it uses three colors and three sizes. The basic routine I learned from Francis Finner and Carlisle. <clears throat> then that'll be done. We'll follow that with copper and silver, which I also learned from Francis, but he credited Di Vernon with the basic idea of, of, of uh, not showing the copper till you had placed the silver in the spectator's hand. Up to that point, you always showed two coins, a copper and silver, you hold this, and the professor came up with the idea, don't show the copper till after you've handed the coin to the spectator so they don't know about the copper till after the work is done. You'll see what I mean during the explanation. Next comes cards to the newspaper, which has had quite a history. My father had two bakeries. I digress, but my father had two bakeries in Brooklyn, and I would go back and forth between them all day to make sure everything was going well. And living almost directly between the two bakeries was a very old magician named Gene Ugard, an Australian magician, Gene Ugard. He was living with, with, with one of his assistants, Myra Benson. They both had gotten old together. Gene was now blind, deaf, and, 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 and in a wheelchair. So I used to do a card through the newspaper that used two covers. It was in Greater Magic, and it was credited to Bill McCaffrey. One day I described the effect to Gene. He was blind and deaf. But he wore a hearing aid, and I described this and, and on this two-cover version of the cards for the newspaper. The next day it came by, and he had had somebody open a book was called The Fine Art of Magic by Kaplan. And then there was a trick called Birds of a Feather, which was the same effect using one cover, but it required an awful lot of slights and work. And he wondered if I could work out a way that was simpler. So I did some, some fussing around and got a, a, an easier version of the one cover card through the newspaper. And Gene Ugard published it in his Ugard's Magic Monthly sometime during the year of 1955. He gave it a very fanciful name, which was the meeting at the summit, in which Ford rulers all gathered at a meeting at a big castle. Some years later, Vernon made some improvements, and I've now done that effect for the past almost, well, the past 30 years, and uh, you'll see the, the effect as this goes along. After that, we do clink, clink, clink. That's a coin under a glass, which is again mine, and it happened by accident. One day I was doing a show, and I did clink, 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 and so I worked out this routine on my own. We close with an effect that we're not going to explain, but it's, it's an old, a very hoary old effect that's done called glass through the table. And this is my version of it. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm about to perform and I'll show you Magic by Gosh, a little tabletop performance, and thank you. Girls, would you please come in a little closer? Now, that's fine. A little closer. Come close because you're more my style anyway. Now, my name's Albert. What's yours? Judy. Judy. Hello. Judy, I'm going to magish for you and you too. And I have here a little purse, Judy. That's a pocketbook. Now, it's hard to believe that that's a pocketbook. It's called a Las Vegas style. But I wouldn't joke with you for the world, honestly. I wouldn't joke with you for the world. But you see, Judy, it's heads, it's heads, and it's tails. You know what the real problem is? The middle. What's your name? Nancy. Nancy. Nancy, say go. Go. Gone. <laughs> Judy, do you remember there were two fifty cents? Definitely. Do you have them? Not me. Say maybe. Maybe. That's a better answer. Would you like to know where I snuck the first one? Oh, yes. The first one's under the pepper shaker. The first one's under the pepper shaker. Show them, please. Show them. Thank you. <laughs> Don't laugh. You never get a break. Never. <laughs> Nancy, how can you get a break when the second one is back here in the pocketbook? Let's try it again. Would you say go? Go. Gone. <laughs> Nancy, it's not here. It's not here, and that's the first one. Oh, no. Yes, dear. Show them. Nancy, you didn't get anything. Nothing. Oh, that's terrible. Hold this for me. 
you waited too long. <laughs> See, Nancy, when you weren't looking, I put them both in the pocketbook. Boy, that's confusing. Let's start all over. <clears throat> My name's Albert. What's yours? Judy. Judy! Hi. I'm going to magish for you again. <laughs> Nancy, would you say go? Go. Say please. Please. Please go. Please go. It's gone. <laughs> you see, it's not here. It's not here. It's no. Not there. And it's not here. No. And that's the first one. Oh, no, not again. Yes, dear. They said, they said that I was working a little too quick. And they wondered, could you look, could you put this one here that way? And then I'll hide one on this side. So now there's one under each. Together, girls. Together, girls. Thank you. Oh <laughs> Nancy, such a lovely name. Hold that for me, Nancy. You wait too long. <laughs> oh, pardon me. Excuse me, dear. It doesn't sprinkle. It doesn't sprinkle. It just makes you nervous. <laughs> now, you know, I've got a funny nickname. I've got a funny nickname. What? What is it? What is it? They call me Two Purse Albert. <laughs> See, they used to call me worse, much worse, but now they call me two purse. Now, would you do me a tiny favor if I asked nicely? Sure. It's very simple. Just say, please. Please. Show them. Show them. Show them. Show them. Oh, my oh, God. God. <laughs> Put the shaker in closer, and you put yours in closer, because the, uh... Already? Sorry about oh. that. It's your <laughs> fault. You didn't say please. If you say please, I'll do it. Please. I did it. Oh, God. <laughs> now, let me get these out of here, because they're bothering me. See, there we are. Oh, no. oh yes. These are matzo balls. <laughs> Where's the soup? The soup? Uh, now, one is larger than the other, and they say that one is always larger, larger than, than the other. other. Yes, dear. Hold this one tight, tight, tight. Now say go. Go. Mine's gone. Yours is gone? It is. It isn't? Slowly. Uh, oh, uh. you got a <laughs> Oh, my. So then, well, here, here, here's, here's two for thee. See here? Two for thee. And one for me, and like a mirage that shimmers in the desert's dust. Slowly, because you've got three. Oh, my <laughs> God. If I don't have them, don't look at me. <laughs> you didn't say please. Oh. Say it. Please. I did it. I did it. <laughs>
Now, I've been hiding. Bring back your salt shaker, please. Bring back the pepper shaker. Thank you so much. Now, I've been hiding a coin under the shaker over and over. And they said it wasn't fair. It wasn't fair because you've got all that salt and seasoning in the way. See, and then a voice cried out in the wilderness, and it said, Albert, can you hide it under a glass? You see, under a glass, you'd know the moment. Under a glass, you could catch me. So rivet your attention on that 50 cents, the one that's under the glass. Because they said, do you have the nerve, look, the gall and the talent? That's what, this is what makes him crazy, though, you see? That really makes him real crazy. I want a favor, Judy. Uh, Say please. Please. Show him. Oh, yes, dear. I'll, I'll, <laughs> you keep it on, Judy, don't look away, right over here. See if you can follow from here to here. Did you see it go? You're looking at me. Don't look at me. Yes, dear. Please. Yes. No, I put it here. Oh, <laughs> But you see, that's a giant Indian head penny. I'm shrinking inflation too large, too late. And that's called too much, you see. <clears throat> I say please. Please. Show them. <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> now, oh have a little pepper, dear. Now, one coin, just checking, I just want to make sure that one coin through the table, oh, sorry about that. One coin through the table, one coin through the center of the table, watch. Judy, would you like to see it go through the table now? Yes. You would? Yes. I'd like to see it myself. <laughs> I wish I could do it. I can do it, but I cheat. I cheat by covering the glass over the coin and placing the covered glass over the coin quietly. Mm. He said quietly. Look, without a sound, it's go... Oh, you're looking here. Do you think I, I might have... I, Say yes. Uh -huh, yes. No, no, no. I put one here, uh -huh. but that's not the same one. So now, no, 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 no. See, I wouldn't kid you for the world. Now, I'd like your opinion. I'd like your opinion. Heads or tails? Heads. No, no, you're wrong. See, it's on edge. And then I cheat. I look which way it was, and then by just pushing the glass a little bit, you see what happened? Look, see. Now let's try it again. This time I won't cheat. This time I'll spin the coin. Do that, you hear it? We'll give the coin a spin. Now it's on edge, and I haven't looked. So do you want heads or tails? Tails. I scratched down it. Well, that gives us, you see, tails. You see tails? Now watch carefully, and if you listen, you'll hear the coin go through the table. So let me your hand, just tap, tap this gently. <laughs> Here you go. Oh, Thank you so much. It's been a joy and a pleasure. Thank you, girls, for helping. Thank you, Thank you for helping. Thank you. Thank you. The salt and pepper shaker routine. Let me start off with some nomenclature, so some words so we'll, we'll know what we're talking about. The word slight means a secret move. Now, if you cannot do the move as a secret move, then you try to do the, the slight under cover of another move. And if it's not possible to do it under cover of another move, then you try to do, have an action or a misdirection in another direction to do the slight. Now, the salt and pepper shaker the loading, the loading of the salt and pepper shaker, is no way that you can really hide it. If somebody's watching, they'll see the load. But if you can get them to look away at that moment, then you can load the salt shaker or the pepper shaker very easily. Now the load itself is very simple. 
The coin is classic palmed. It's dropped, and the shaker is put on top of it. That's all there is to it. The coin is classic palmed, and it's put on top. It's done very softly, very slowly, and very smoothly, while the other hand is doing something. The act begins with three coins. One classic palmed in the right hand, and two half dollars edge palmed in the left hand. And you have a purse frame, or two purse frames, in your belt. And you come out and you say, my name's Albert. And you turn your shoulders to the spectator on this side, and you look her right in the eyes, and you say, my name's Albert, what's yours? And as you're looking and talking, the left hand, or the right hand, the right hand loads the shaker. Nobody's expecting it yet, and they're all looking at this. You say, my name's Albert, what's yours? Judy, Judy, I'm going to magish for you. I have here a little purse. That's a pocketbook. It's hard to believe that that's a pocketbook. Now remember, you have the two edge palmed in this hand. So you reach in, take out the two that have been edge palmed in this hand. Now there are three coins. One is hidden here, two are here. And during the whole routine, all they see is two. So it's just a natural, normal human instinct. Every time two coins appear, people relax because now they see the both coins. You've got this wonderful weapon of the third coin they don't know about. The first one you say, heads, tails, say go, go. gone, and you've classic palm that one. I pick up the second one. This time I'm going to thumb palm there. Say go, go. gone. See, I've, I've palmed both in the same hand. One is thumb palmed and one is finger palmed. One is classic palmed and one is thumb palmed. You turn to the spectator and you say, do you remember those 250 cents? She says, yes. Do you have them? She probably says, no. You say, the first one is under the pepper shaker. Now, here's the situation. The left hand is sitting here very innocently, kind of half folded. The right hand is pointing. And you say, pick it up. And as she picks it up and you're doing this, you throw the classic palm coin into that hand. So she picks it up. You kick this over. And you turn away this way and you say, you never get a break. And this hand loads here again. Now you say, the second one is back here in the pocket. Let's do it again. Would you say go? Go. Gone. You see, it's not here. Because you're holding this and, and it's not here. And that's the first one. Now you come around and look. She picks it up and shows it. Now everybody relaxes because they see two and you do this and again... You now put the third coin under here. Now a clink pass. Clink, hold this, never mind. Both <laughs> coins are here. You take them out of the pocketbook when you weren't looking. Let's start all over. My name's Albert, what's yours? Judy Williams. Judy, I'm going to magish for you. Now, remember, we're still the one ahead. Now we go and we say, say go. Go. Please. Please. Please go. Please go. It's gone. <laughs> And you say, it's not here, and you put this in your right hand with the palmed coin. You pick up this in your left. And you turn to Judy, and you look. And Judy picks it up. Now, while Judy is picking, you're looking at the first frame. Judy is lifting, and you're looking. So you either look here, or you look here. In the meantime, I'm loading with this hand. I'm loading this shaker while I'm looking here. You may be watching here or here, but you certainly have no reason to watch here. Now we change... Entirely different system. The coin we show is the coin we load. You come from here, you make believe. See, nothing's here. And you do this, and you throw that left hand reverse. I'll do that again. Because the one you show is the one you load. From here, load the shaker and a reverse toss. So you, now you, there's one already here from before. So you say, I'm going to put one on this side. Boop, you really don't do anything other than the vanish. Girls, together. You throw this in this hand, hit the shaker, and once again load this. Now you do a clink pass. Hold this. Never mind. <laughs> and you instantly reach into your pocket, instantly bring out two coins. At this point you want to do a couple of diversions. If you were to reach right away and pull the two that you've got hidden here, they would know it's not the same two. So you start off by saying, I, I, I do a sprinkle with the shaker, make some jokes. 
I say, my, my name is Tupar Shal, but all that's being done to take the curse off these two from in, in, in your right hand. And after you've done the sprinkling and the two per salvet, then you reach in and you've got the four. Now at that point, I do, a, uh, I do a coin roll with both hands. I do a coin roll together. Then I do a coin roll backwards and forwards together. Evidence of a misspent youth. Thank you so much. In your right hand money pocket, the small pocket in your jacket, you have two English pennies. And at some point, if you remember, you had the four coins. So you toss three, you look like you tossed four, but you toss three, and you miss, you hold one just at the fingertips. And you put everything away, and as you go to your right hand pocket, your classic palm, the half a dollar, and you pick up the two English pennies. You come out just holding them at the fingertips. You make no effort to take a secret grip or anything. And you're standing here now, so now you're standing here with a coin, the 50 cents classic palm, the two pennies, are at your fingertips. You say to the girl, show them. She picks it up and there's nothing there. As she picks it up, you throw the two, fifth, the, two, the two copper pennies in your hand. And you say, you didn't say please. And you look over here and you load the shaker. I'll do that again. Pick it up, Judy. It's not there. You say, it's your fault you didn't say please. If you say please, I'll do it. She shows, and as she, there's two things that, and as she shows the coin there now, go ahead. You throw one of the pennies back in this hand. Kick this away, do this, and you say, give me your hand. See, what I just did then was I put through the second one over here as I got her hand. And I say, 50 cents. 50 cents. Hold the 50 cents tight. I'm going to vanish it out of your hand. Remember, there's a classic palmed copper penny. And I make a switch. I say, hold it. I've given her the penny, and I've got the, the half dollar. That's just a switch. Open your hand up, Nancy. This is here. This is here, and I do that and give her the coin. Oh. I, you, you don't have it? Oh, you missed it. Okay. Now, she thinks she's holding half a dollar, but she's got the penny. You're holding the half a dollar in your classic palm. You now turn to, the, to Judy on this side, and you say, did you ever see an English penny? And she says, no. Say, please. Please. And she picks up and shows the English penny, which you loaded before. You put the penny on the back of Nancy's hand, so that she can't open her hand. Right now, there's no way she can open her hand to look. You say, what's in my hand? She says, a penny. If she says a half a dollar, you say, no, no, a penny. You throw the penny on the table. And I say, what are you holding? And at that moment, what are you holding? You switch again. She says, I've got 50 cents. 50 cents. You say, no, I've got 50 cents. As she opens her hand, she's got the penny. In that moment, everybody's looking here. You load the penny under here. Now you take and you say, hold the penny, never mind. And you then look at the shaker. And of course, Judy now picks it up. And you say, you didn't say please. I'm going to give you a fighting chance. Straighten up the shaker, mine, not yours. Thank you, closer if you want miracles. That's the line you use if they put it a little too far away. So remember, you're sitting with a palmed English penny and one on the table. And now, this again, you come over here. And you do this, you say, put two fingers. You know why two fingers? Too late. And that clothes show them, and that, go ahead, and that finishes the routine. Thank you so much. The sponge ball routine is a little different and is based on a new principle and uses three different sizes and three different colors. That's in the left-hand pocket. The right-hand pocket, you, can, you have a duplicate of the small one. And in your belt, you have a purse frame. Now, two things happen, si happen simultaneously. Hard to say that, happen simultaneously. <laughs> happen simultaneously. The right hand goes to the belt to pull out the purse frame, and the left hand goes in the pocket and grab the three sponge balls. This comes out just an instant before this one does. 
Now you follow this. I have here a little purse, that's a pocketbook. And you reach in and you take out the three little sponge balls that you just took out of your pocket. I put the purse frame down with an easy reach because later you have to pick that up to put it away. Now you start the funny lines, or you think they're funny. <laughs> One is larger than the other. One is always larger. The basic principle is that you hide the small one behind the large one. So watch, I make a pass, which is, I make believe this, and here it is, and I pick up the red, and I hide the black one behind it. I'll do that again. Watch, get this. And I'll, now look, there's no need to rush. Don't close your hand, Nancy. You can do this. Open your hand a little more. But you see, the black one is hidden behind the red one. Now close your hand. Now. In order that they shouldn't know when it vanished, I do a reverse pass. I throw the, this to this. I'll do that again. Now watch the peculiar story. Now, the black is passed away. You hide it behind the red. Close your hand. Now you do this, a left hand reverse. Now it's gone. By doing that, that, and that, they're not sure did it vanish right to left or left to right. It leaves you thinking. Now you say, open your hand. And of course, now she's got two. Now based on your audience, doesn't that feel normal? Or if you're working for kids, well, you can't use that line, of course. I take the purse frame and I put it in my right hand pocket and I take out the black sponge ball and the thumb palm. Now I say, two for thee, and I do that, but I've hidden the black one behind the red one. So there's no need to rush. You can do this and say, hold the two for you, hold the two for you, close your hand, and the one for me. And of course, my favorite line on like a mirage that shimmers on the desert's dust. Like a ghost that vanishes into the walls of an old, old castle. Slowly, because you've got three. I mean, sponge balls. Now that line may or may not suit your personality, I'm just giving it for completeness. Now she opens her hand, the sponge balls have a terrible tendency to want to rush off the table, so say slowly and be ready to catch. So open your hand slowly, and, and so one, two, three different sizes, three different colors. Now again, this one waits for later when she, you say go, show them, say please. please. And then she, oh, you say, I'm sorry, you didn't say pretty please. And you load the shaker that you had left off, you load the sponge ball, the one that was in your fourth one, you, you load it under the shaker, you say, say pretty please. Pretty, pretty. And you say, I, I did it, I did it. So you don't want to waste anything, so you get use out of the fourth one. So once again, to emphasize, I like to do this vanish with nothing. It's very hard to lie to yourself. And if you put something in your hand, you want to make believe you throw it, you have a tendency to do this, you have a tendency to do this, you have a tendency to do this. So I practiced through the years this, this toss with nothing. I'd make believe and I would do this. And once I was able to get this action, this kind of throw thing, with nothing in my hands, and I, I, I then took up and I did it with a sponge ball or with a coin. It's more of a timing thing rather than a slight. It's just the feel. And from this side, this is the action. You see, you thump on, you make believe. But the action must simulate identically the throwing, and then it's got to be the same when you do the thing. I spoke earlier of Francis Finner and Carlisle. And Francis had a very nice vanish, which I liked, which was this. Okay. And Francis had variations on that where he would come down and let you see it in there. And it would then go. And that's simply a question of tearing it out of your hand and being able to thumb palm extremely well without any movement in this hand. Now let me do it an exposed sight for you. That's the way it looks from the back side. And on the front side, if you'll look at this hand, forget the hand holding the sponge ball. If you look here, you will see almost no movement of the thumb palm. Now watch the wrong hand. Disregard this, just watch this. And you see it's gone, and it's here. Now you can do the same thing with a coin. You have this here, and you simulate the same thing, that same throwing motion. Now, Francis used to do a thing, Carl, I used to do a thing where he would put a coin in his hand and do that. And it would vanish, and that was the same thing. So, 
the basic principles hold for all small objects. Once you learn to get this, this funny little throwing action, it works with everything, and it's only a timing move. The French have a word, T-E-M-P, temp. And it really means the moment. And it's hard to explain the moment, the correct moment. So, but the French word does it identically, exactly. The moment to put the coin under the shaker, the moment for this, temp. It's, uh, I don't know if there's a word in the English language that, that quite means the same thing, that correct moment. Udu temp, which is the name of the perfume, the correct moment. So, and again, just for the sake of completeness, that funny vanish, you pick up and you load the black or the smaller one behind. Hold it, Nancy. And then you throw this, even though the hand is empty, you do a reverse pass from left to right before you vanish. Thank you so much. And now... In a tape of this kind, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to cover every subtle little point. There's no way, unless we made the tape many, many hours long. And I've written a book, Magic by Gosh, The Life and Times of Albert Goshman, in which all these things have been described in very much greater detail than I can do it here. At the end of the tape, or if you look on the tape jacket, you'll see the... the uh, address where you can either send to me and buy the book from me or you can go to your favorite magic depot and he'll either have it or get it for you thank you so much the cards through the newspaper are based on two, uh, there are two subtleties. One is that there are five cards instead of four. There are two twos, a duplicate two or a stranger two. There are five cards. And there are two switches, which I'll show you, two fairly indetectable switches. <clears throat> now, the ace goes face up on the upper right-hand corner. The two face up on the lower right hand corner. The three is show, and you put it face down. That's because later you're going to have to turn it over anyway, so you might as well have it face down to begin with. In your hand, the two cards, the ace, the four, and the two. As you cover the little packet this way, you step, you push with your finger, and you get a step. That makes it easier later on to pick up this card without any fumbling. The right hand picks up the three. The left hand picks up the newspaper and the duplicate two. You show the three, you go under the paper as to turn this over. And that action, what you did, was you came down here and ostensibly you came out with the same card, but you really didn't. It looks like you came out, but you switched. Now you cover the four you call this a three you call this a three but you can't show it now you go under the paper and this is what happens under the paper let me show you above you go forward back put it in your fingers and come sideways forward back and sideways so we come here here this way see it's in the fingers you lift and you show that the two has arrived and come away here with the three Now the two. This is the duplicate two. You go under and you leave it. You make a fuss about this hand. You make a fuss about this hand. And now you show that the two is arrived and you show it face down, but you don't turn it over because you need an excuse or a lie to come back later. So remember, you've got a face down two here and you've got a two underneath the newspaper. The ace. You go under the paper with the ace and leave it in your fingers and you suddenly remember that you forgot to turn the two over. So you come out with what ostensibly is the ace, but it's really the other two. And you come over this way to turn the two over. That was just an excuse. The effect is all done except for the selling. Call this an ace, but you can't show it. It's really a two. Go under the paper, leave it in the fingers. 
thusly. This goes here. You showed this. I see you sitting over here with the extra two. Put the four cards there with this because everybody's waiting to see what's under here and you make a big fuss and there's nothing. Thank you ever so much. The, the coin on the glass requires 250 cents and a large coin and you have to have a coin hidden under the pepper shaker. Now you reach into the left hand pocket, bring out 250 cents and it's kind of an offbeat thing, offhand thing. You put this hand in the pocket as if you're putting the coin away, the half dollar away, put your classic palm it and you bring it out. Now the paddle line, as you say, I've been hiding a coin under the shaker over and over and over and over. And it's not fair because you got all that salt and seasoning in the way. Truly, truly, you don't know the moment. See, and then a voice cried out in the wilderness and it said, Albert, can you hide it under a glass? Under a glass. Now each time you say the words under a glass, you clink. And the clinking is like a hypnotism thing. They, they, you make them crazy. Under a glass, you'd know the moment. Under a glass, see, you'd catch me. See, I, under a glass. Now, they don't know that you're making them nuts with that clink if the room is silent. They go clink, clink, clink. Now you say, do you have the nerve? You click this across, the gall and the talent, you see, and you go clink. Clink, clink. Now, I'll explain that. So much happens in such a short time that it's very difficult. You, you, this hand has got the coin. You skid it across the table. Now, watch. You pick this up and hold it and look at it. You load the, the glass. And at the same time, you throw this into the right hand. You make a shift back. It's a continuous move this way. And you come back down. You'll clink, clink, clink. You say, this makes him crazy. You hit the glass. And as you pick this up, you load the shaker again. You put both these coins away and you reach into both pockets simultaneously and you come out with the big coin, which you hold this way. You can't really classic palm it, it's too large. So you kind of wedge it between one edge of your palm and the thumb and you're holding it, the coin this way. And you say to the girl, say please. And she picks it up. Now you bring this hand over and say please, it's got to pick it up. And at that moment, you load this under the glass, but your hand is in the way. So pick it up again, pick it up, and let me see. And you put the shaker right here. You leave your finger there, that gives you an excuse for hiding the coin, which is under the glass here. Now you say, watch it again, did you see it happen? And you look up and she says, no, then you say, show him. As she shows him, you come over and you say, no, over here. Now to make her crazy, you wave this glass in the air and you load the shaker again. You say, a large, Indian head penny. I'm shrinking. Now you hit this one. <laughs> too large. Now you do a pass. You say, too late. Now you're holding it over here. So you come over with the same hand that you're holding it with. You aim over there that way and you load this. You say, this. I don't want so. And you load this and now you come over here. You vanish it and you say, say please. And then they look down. And there is the shaker. All right. Thank you so much. About, about 1965, two magicians came to the Magic Castle. F.W. Ross of St. Joe, Missouri, and Ross Bertram of Canada came to the Magic Castle and, and told me about a magician that they knew all 25, before year, 25 years before in Hollywood named Manuel, Master of the Mighty Dollar. And Manuel did a thing where he vanished Four silver dollars, one at a time, 
without any noise, and then he turned his hand over, and they were in four different positions. Fawcett said to me, I don't remember the positions, Albert, but I'm sure you could work it out. So I fussed around for a little while, and then I was able to vanish four coins without noise. Over a period of time, I got it up to six coins, and that's where it stood for a number of years. I did a lecture tour in Germany, and the fellow who laid out the tour sent me one day, he would have me in Munich, the next day up in Hamburg, the next day back in Frankfurt, and I was spending long days, very long days, on the train, going back and forth, get on the train every morning at six o'clock and arrive at four o'clock in the afternoon at my lecture. Well, it was a long, boring ride, and I started to fuss around with the coins, and I, at that point I was able to work out the vanish, or the silent vanish, of ten coins. Now, let me show you three, 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 two, three and two is five, five and two is seven, seven, seven and one is eight, Eight and one is nine, and nine and one is ten. Now, we've taken and we've placed the coins pretty much in ten different places. So that's been the vanish of ten coins without noise. Well, to give you an explanation and a demonstration, of the vanish of the ten coins without noise. The first three, the first three are done with a clink pass, this way, thusly. And you rotate the coins and put them into an edge palm, an edge palm, this way. The next two are done into a thumb palm. Thumb palm, that makes five. Now we go to a tenkai vanish, and the coins end up held between the last two fingers, out, parallel to the table. The next coin, the, the, the next coin fits in the English purse palm between these two fingers, thusly, thusly, see, there's the English purse palm. The last two, number nine and number ten, one goes in, the, in there, one goes in there. Watch. You say it takes two shakes. You shake once, you say, but it takes two shakes. Now you pick up the last one, you say it takes three shakes. You say, three shakes. So let me show you where the coins are. Number ten. Number nine. Number eight out of the English price palm. Number seven and number six between the last two fingers. Five and four out of the thumb palm. And one, two, and three out of the edge palm. I'll do it once more because there's a lot of moves there and, and you might... You, uh, so you can see three into the edge palm, two into the thumb palm, two down into these fingers, between the last two fingers, one into the English purse palm, one fits between the two middle fingers, and the last one, the tenth one, thusly. Okay. And that's the vanish of ten coins. Well, we're coming to the end of this tape. And I've explained some moves, some misdirection. But that's not where the name of the game is. For years now, I've lectured at magic clubs, and I've always had the, the same cry. The magic is you. They haven't come to see that pretty box. 
or that funny little piece of apparatus, they've come to see you perform. Somewhere along the line, we all join a magic club and we get the idea that you buy the magic. And part of the fun of being an amateur magician or hobbyist is going every week to the magic shop and buying new magic, we think. But that's not where it's at. Remember, a professional makes a living by doing his old act for new audiences year after year. And as a consequence, he gets good, smooth, knows how to get out of trouble. The amateur buys a new trick every week for his old audiences. And he never does anything long enough because he's always got the old audiences. Now, if a magic trick is so good, if you spend your life looking for the magic trick that's going to make you famous or good, and if such a thing exists, then everybody's going to run out and want to buy it. You know what happens now? If somebody does a magic trick on television, the next day, every magic shop in America has magicians looking for that particular item. They don't want to do their own thinking. They want your trick, they want your patter, they want your presentation, they want to swallow you all, but they don't want to do any thinking. About 1942, I was 22 years old, and I joined the Magic Club in New York City. Well, some 40 odd years have gone by, and every time I come to New York, I go back to the Magic Club to the, to when it meets, and it's like I never left. We could suppose that in the 40 years that have been sued, I've passed by, there have been eight generations of magicians. Just come along with me. Members have joined, they have learned from the older members. They in turn have taught the newer members. Members have died, members have fallen out. But let us suppose that eight generations of magicians have come into the magic club and left. If I come in now, 40 years later, I see the same terrible card tricks done in the same terrible way, unchanged. It's like, it's like I never left. Each one has taught the new succeeding generation who has taught the following generation without adding anything, without thinking. Each one has swallowed up the effects. It, it's nobody, it, just a very, very few people break out of the mold and do some original thinking. The rest do the same. I, they, when, when I say to them, look, but I see what you're doing, they say to me, well, you see it but the audience doesn't, and that's poppycock. If I see it, I know what you're doing. If they see something, they don't know what you're doing, but they know you did something. That would be all right if you're working for the blind. You've got to do it well. It should, nothing should be visible to the audience. Now, the magic is you. They came to see you, not that joyous, expensive, beautiful little prop. If you look at the people in magic, or for that matter, in any of the arts, whether it's acting, singing, dancing, those who have an original touch, those are the ones that are su su successful. I did a magic show once for Lee J. Cobb. Lee J. Cobb was a famous actor. One of his favorite roles and one of his famous roles was Death of a Salesman. Several months later, I'm walking down the street and a voice behind me says, Hello, Albert. Without turning around, I knew it was Lee J. Cobb. Now that set me to thinking. You knew it was Lee J. Cobb without turning around. He had something that was different, something that was unique. If you go to a magic convention now, and you watch a show, you will see four people, or four performers, each doing the vanishing birdcage. Or three performers doing the mutilated parasol. Each one identical, Nothing to differentiate them from anyone else. The successful performers are the performers that have done things that make them stand out above the crowd. Through the years I've seen performers not always in magic, and in many cases I was in a foreign country and didn't understand the language. And the word is charisma, but the charisma of the performer was so strong that it didn't matter that I didn't understand the language. Strong personality, strong magic, strong charisma overcomes language. The trick is not the thing, you are the thing. 
You have to do something that's different. You have to do something that's unique. You know, if, if, if a um, magician goes into an agent's office and says, I'm a bird man, the agent says, you fly around the room? Now, if you go out every night and you perform and an agent sends you out every night and you get paid, and night after night, the agent sends you out and night after night you get paid, don't ever listen to another magician because you're making it. You work every night regularly. I've spent most of my life in this little art form of magic. I've made a fine living. I've enjoyed going around the world and meeting fellow magicians and hobbyists all over the world. I've had a lot of pleasure performing. I've had shows that were not so good where I could have crawled under the salt shaker if it was possible. So Magic, you have treated me well. I have no complaints. And my favorite closing line, Goddess of Magic, I salute you forever. And thank you ever so much.